Hello, I'm hematologist oncologist Dr. Tony Talibi, and now we're going to discuss the management of non seminoma testicular cancer with Dr. Pascal Benedetto, professor of medicine at University of Miami. Thank you for being here. Welcome, Tony. All right. So let's assume something has led to the discovery of a testicular mass, uh, which has led to surgical removal of the testicle, and the pathology has come back positive for non seminoma. Okay, so. Um, as we talked about earlier in this series, um, the distinction between seminoma and non-seminoma is important because of the natural history of the disease. Mm -hmm. um, while seminoma is usually localized, non-seminoma disease is usually not. And again, when we talk about non-seminoma disease, we're talking about generally a mixture of, of um, histologies, usually embryonal carcinoma, mm -hmm. but any of the other components may be there, yolk sac, um, teratoma, or choreo. Um, the propensity is for this tumor to spread rapidly and so even with a small tumor in the testicle frequently will have evidence of metastatic mm -hmm. disease at the time of diagnosis. Um, if you look at um, the likelihood of having stage 1, 2, or 3 disease at diagnosis, about 85% of patients with seminoma will have disease that um, is stage 1, whereas only about 30% of patients with non-seminoma disease mm -hmm. will have stage 1 disease. So one of the implications of non-seminoma disease is the likelihood that your disease will not be just isolated to the testicle and that additional treatments will be warranted. <clears throat> so once the diagnosis of testicular cancer is made, in this case the markers, the blood tests, are really very important because a large percentage of patients with non-seminoma disease will have elevated um, blood markers. Mm -hmm. And in the course of the evaluation, to identify the true stage, two things have to happen. One is you need to do the scans that we talked about earlier, CAT scan of the abdomen, chest x-ray, and the tumor markers if the, if the imaging is negative. Mm -hmm. um, and the tumor markers which are elevated pre-op become normal mm -hmm. in the post-operative period after waiting the appropriate time. Then the patient has stage one disease. And the decisions with regard to the treatment of stage one disease are slightly different than seminoma. First of all, we do not use radiation therapy. Mm -hmm. The options for stage one disease are either retroperitoneal lymph node dissection, which is what we did for many years. Um, that is really uh, predominantly a staging tool because mm -hmm. the patient who has metastatic disease of lymph nodes that, that you find out by doing that then has a much higher risk than the, the overall 20% but you didn't necessarily cure them. Mm -hmm. The patient who has no um, involvement of the retroperitoneum and has true stage one disease now has a 10% chance mm -hmm. of recurrence because the tumor could spread to um, hematogenously right. or may not be um, identified in the lymph nodes because there could be only small volume tumor that's missed. Um, so we tend not to do retroperitoneal lymph node dissection very much more um, at this um, time for stage one disease. The second option is um, a uh, two cycles of um, chemotherapy with BEP mm -hmm. um, and we generally consider that an, on the base of risk assessment which is those patients who have high risk stage one disease with a likelihood of more than 50 percent for instance of recurrence you might offer that option. Those are people who have vascular invasion, who have embryonal carcinoma only, who have uh, more than a T2 tumor um, you might consider that option, but recognizing that if you, if you provide that as an option to a patient or make that recommendation, you're going to over-treat a population and you're going to give them the side effects down the line of the chemotherapy. And the third option is surveillance, and, and most of us would choose surveillance if you have a compliant patient, and that's another thing we didn't discuss. Surveillance, which is generally a strategy for early stage mm -hmm. testis cancer, is entirely dependent on compliance. Mm -hmm. If the patient will not come back for the follow-up, then they're putting themselves in harm's mm -hmm. way and the decision about surveillance is probably not a good one for the mm -hmm. doctor to make. Mm -hmm. So you have to get some assessment of the, the reliability of the patient in front of you. Mm -hmm. uh, in general, however, if the patient is faced with the idea of getting chemotherapy or coming you know, once a month for labs and x-rays, they usually can make that, that decision fairly quickly. So mm -hmm. most patients with clinical stage one testis cancer, non seminomonous type, will be on surveillance as well, which mm -hmm. means frequent visits to the doctor for markers, chest x-ray, quarterly CAT scans, and your risk for the recurrence of disease is in the first two years. Okay.
and most of that risk is within the first six months, mm. and the vast majority of that risk, so 50% is the first six months, 85% of that risk is the first year, mm -hmm. and essentially 100% of the risk of recurrence occurs within two years. The lack of recurrence of testis cancer after, uh, after two years is most likely the curability of the tumor, that is, it's not going to come back. There are patients who have late relapses of testis cancer, but those are things that we write papers about, and that's a less than 1% likelihood. So in my particular practice, um, I don't employ um, adjuvant chemotherapy for patients with um, testicular cancer, mm -hmm. stage one testicular cancer, even if they appear to have a higher than average risk. Um, and the reason being that if, in fact, you wait a period of time, you will not have to wait for very long for the patient to identify that they in fact have recurrence. They will have good risk disease with essentially 100% likelihood of um, recovery. Um, and the treatment is three cycles, so as opposed to over-treating a number of people with two cycles of chemotherapy, I prefer to, to under-treat mm -hmm. that small portion that is destined to relapse and then salvage them with three cycles an extra three weeks. Um, and you know, there, after we had identified various risk groups, I think that the pendulum there swung to, and I think there are fewer people who give adjuvant chemotherapy. Because I think, as in diseases such as Hodgkin's disease, where we cure a lot of people, we're looking to try to minimize the risks to right. patients, um, minimize the risk of exposure to chemotherapy or radiation or whatever the, the situation might be. So in general, in my practice pattern, um, surveillance is the standard approach for a patient with stage one disease. Now there's a little caveat to that, and that is the, the tumor marker issue. Um, immediately after surgery, your tumor marker um, does not have to become zero. Mm -hmm. It relates to how high your tumor marker was before surgery, so you have to follow through the half-lives. Um, and as long as the patient's tumor marker is decreasing, you want to wait to determine, in, in fact, whether it will normalize. And if so, then the patient is on surveillance. Uh, and as I've said, the natural history is such that if a patient is destined to recur, they're going to do so fairly quickly within the first few months mm -hmm. um, of that follow-up. Most patients, or at least half of the patients, mm -hmm. will recur. For patients with stage 2 disease, that is intra-abdominal um, disease, uh, in general, um, we are giving chemotherapy for those patients and reserving surgical procedure for residual masses. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, the, if you have teratoma in your primary tumor, the likelihood that you will have a residual mass and need surgery is higher, mm -hmm. um, but our preference pattern is for patients to get chemotherapy, um, eradicate the viable tumor, and resect the residual disease if there is any. Uh, and obviously, if you have tumor that's in a, um, another organ or particularly the lungs, the only option you have is a chemotherapy approach. The chemotherapy for non seminoma disease is based on this risk assessment, good risk versus mm -hmm, poor risk, mm -hmm. um, or good intermediate, or favorable intermediate, um, and unfavorable in the um, International Germ Cell Consensus Group um, uh, staging system. And if you have good risk, you get three cycles of BEP, and if you have poor risk, you get four cycles of BEP. And we really haven't been able to identify a better first-line treatment program for patients with poor risk testis cancer outside of BEP. They're poor risk because their likelihood of, of having a complete remission with chemotherapy falls in the 60% or less range, whereas in the um, good risk, we're talking about more than 90%. Uh, and in certain... Um, subcategories of patients with good risk, like marker-only disease, the likelihood of, of remission with chemotherapy is basically 99%. Um, so the difference in the chemotherapy program for non seminoma disease is not in the drugs that we use, but the number of cycles, and that's mm -hmm. entirely dependent on the risk assessment at the uh, initial stage, and the difference between 9 weeks or 12 weeks um, for that population of patients. Would you please explain again what is BEP? So BEP is a three-drug regimen, a very simple three-drug regimen of bleomycin and topazide platinum. Um, the, a cycle is a three-week mm -hmm. um, drug a cycle of which first five days of the cycle is platinum and BP-16 every day. And each week, one time in the week is uh, bleomycin. And then you repeat that cycle three times. So that's nine weeks of BEP. And what are the side effects associated with it? So the side effects of the chemotherapy are, are 
what you might expect of many chemotherapies. Things like nausea or vomiting um, are um, associated, but not particularly common. Maybe nausea is more common than vomiting. I mean, we're very good with HG3 blockers, with um, mm -hmm. uh, substance P blockers, with use of steroids, um, Ativan, etc. cetera, mm -hmm. um, that we pretty much eliminated nausea vomiting for, from the uh, circumstance of patients. I, I can recall the days when we really used to mm -hmm. um, sedate patients through cisplatinum therapy. Mm -hmm. The dose of cisplatinum is small, although it accumulates over the week, um, and the patients tend to do pretty well, you know, sitting up, eating, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to, you know, having their heads uh, bowed over mm -hmm. the garbage can or the um, basin. Uh, so the, the other um, things that happen are a reduction in the blood counts with each cycle. So as you might expect, between day um, 10 and 14, your blood count is somewhat low, mm -hmm. but that it doesn't usually result in febrile neutropenia. The incidence of febrile neutropenia with BEP is very low, and so we don't really need to give growth factors. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you treat through all of the blood counts. It really doesn't matter what the blood count is. Once you start the treatment, you, can, you don't look and require a certain blood count at the day one of the second or third cycle. Generally, they have an absolute granulocytopenia, and we treat through it um, without any difficulty. Mm -hmm. Um, there is hair loss associated with the chemotherapy, um, and uh, there are a couple of long-term risks, uh, things like uh, hypertension, mm -hmm. Raynaud's phenomenon, <coughs> um, and infertility. Um, but these are actually not as frequent as you might read about them in a book. Mm -hmm. uh, so for the most part, the short-term toxicities are limited and reversible and the long-term toxicities are relatively infrequent in incidence. I see. Now, why is it that if there's a residual mass, why does it have to be removed surgically? What's the significance? Okay, so this is a much more important circumstance in the non seminomous category because there is the potential for um, the persistence of teratoma. Mm -hmm. So teratoma of itself is undifferentiated tissue in a random assignment. Mm -hmm. uh, and patients with teratoma can de-differentiate, that is, they can develop malignant degeneration of the teratoma, which is a very significant complication mm -hmm. and difficult to treat um, disease. So you really want to be sure that you do not leave any teratoma behind. So if you have a residual mass and there's the possibility it's teratoma, then it needs to be removed. Um, so in the, in the situation of non seminomal disease where the, the possibility of teratoma is actually higher, um, than seminoma because seminoma should not have a teratominous element at all, mm -hmm. then you, you want to resect anything that is more than minimal in size that's left over. Mm -hmm. There is the, the occasional patient who completes chemotherapy and everything looks fine, and on a follow-up scan, you see an enlarging mass where you didn't really see it before, maybe in the general area where the tumor might have been. And in that situation, if the markers are negative, you, you need to think strongly that the patient may in fact have, a, have had a residual area mm -hmm. of teratoma that wasn't identified that grew. So that is another reason why you continue to get CAT scans for a period of time after the treatment, to be sure that somebody doesn't have an unsuspected location of a teratoma that will then become an issue for them in the future. Yes. But the, the major reason is to be sure you don't have viable tumor, but more importantly that you don't leave behind teratoma. Okay. And what if the patient relapses? What is the difference between an early versus a late relapse? Okay, so the, the major, the, the, the definition mm -hmm. of early versus late relapse is two years. So if you relapse two years after diagnosis, <coughs> Or treatment that is considered um, before two years is considered um, I guess a standard relapse or a recurrence and after that a late relapse. Late relapse patients tend to have um, disease which is not necessarily um, chemosensitive mm. and so in that situation you would tend to resect their recurrent disease unless it was unresectable or in multiple sites. Patients who have relapse within that two years after treatment um, can be salvaged with additional therapy. Mm. If they have refractory disease, which means that they don't respond while they're getting first-line BEP or they relapse right after they complete the BEP, those patients tend to do much more poorly because mm. they tend to be 
platinum refractory, which makes it difficult for you to overcome the disease because platinum is the, sing the one mm -hmm. single major drug for this disease. Um, but you really see very few people who have that phenomenon. I see. Um, and in fact, the vast majority of patients with first-line therapy um, should be cured because most patients will have you know, good risk early stage disease um, if, if they're sensitive about you know, what's mm -hmm. going on with their body and if they have access to health care because they will go fairly quickly. I see. Well, what about it? What is an autologous stem cell transplant and is there a role in testicular cancer? So the autologous stem cell transplant basically is a mechanism by which you give high doses of chemotherapy um, to a tumor that has sensitivity to those mm -hmm. drugs to overcome drug resistance. So you're basically moving the dose response curve by increasing the, the dose of the drug. Mm -hmm. And that is a strategy used for testicular cancer and, and it used to be second line strategy. That is, first line was BEP, and second line was salvage therapy with transplant. Um, and the transplant basically is simply removing your marrow, bombarding you with chemotherapy mm -hmm. so that your, your bone marrow suppression is not a critical factor and then giving you back your marrow mm -hmm. to reconstitute your, um, giving you back your um, stem cells to reconstitute your bone marrow and your um, peripheral blood um, once those drugs have done their job in trying to kill the tumor. So that strategy of high dose chemotherapy and stem cell um, rescue was a second line strategy um, before we developed um, better salvage therapy. Mm -hmm. I think at the present time most of us would um, relegate stem cell therapy to third-line treatment. That is, first-line therapy would be BEP in mm -hmm. basically everyone's case. In those patients that fail, which should be a small percentage mm -hmm. of the population, um, you would consider salvage with something like TIP, taxolifosamide mm -hmm. platinum. That has a very high response rate in, for second line, and therefore relapse after that is even a smaller number. Mm -hmm. So the number of patients these days that are really candidates for stem cell therapy are very small. Mm -hmm. Uh, the population that more likely will result in the need for third-line therapy may be the population that starts out with poor risk disease to begin with, large mm -hmm. volume, mm -hmm. um, and difficult to um, achieve a remission. So that is a strategy, but I think in the 21st century we probably would relegate that to third-line treatment, mm -hmm. and, and the population of patients that actually fit that is very small if the first-line treatment is done well. When would you recommend palliative care or hospice for a refractory or a relapse patient? Uh, well, I, I, I'm. Uh, that doesn't happen most of the time because most mm -hmm. patients um, achieve a clinical remission with mm -hmm. first line therapy or second line therapy. But I, in the course of my lengthy experience um, in the disease, there's one or two patients who had refractory disease and. Uh, there is some life even after transplant, so there are some drugs that have a small chance. And so mm -hmm. I think probably if you get to fourth line therapy, which are things like uh, Gemsar and Oxaliplatinum, et cetera, and if the patient has um, you know, a good performance status, I mean, at that point, they should be considered for clinical trial, but yeah. there are some agents that might be used. There's some enthusiasm um, for the use of uh, monoclonal antibody because the brinal carcinoma expresses CD30. We now have an agent that actually targets CD30, and there's some interest in looking at whether this might be a strategy for patients with uh, refractory testis cancer. But I, I think when you get to fourth-line therapy, you, are, you probably do not have curable disease, and you have to have reasonable discussions with the patient about the likelihood of achieving that remission. And you would make the same decision in any other cancer. Once you're faced with the low likelihood of cure, that you know, what, what's the, the value of the chemotherapy in that patient, depending on performance status, uh, extent of disease, and, you know, their, their general well-being, which is part of performance status. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for watching. We hope this has been educational for you.